I'm going to talk about William Blake. And I think he's a figure that really matters now. Maybe doubly so for, for us who live in South London. He's our local mystic and visionary. I guess one of the best known, if not the most famous Christian from this part of the world. And he matters now because he spotted 200 years ago when he lived what was coming down the line and is now fully manifest in our world for good and for ill. And his sharp critique, he's a, he's a very astute thinker, an analyst of our modern age, as much as a brilliant creative and wordsmith, um, the figure that's known in the popular imagination. One of those figures that you know, many people have heard of, perhaps even quite a number can quote a line or two of his, not least, and did those feet in ancient time, walk upon England's mountain green, the famous hymn Jerusalem. But perhaps it sort of stops there, and there isn't much of a sense of what was really driving him to talk about chariots of fire and arrows of desire and so on, and the mental fight of our time. So I hope this evening that um, you'll have a much keener sense of what Blake was about in the next hour or so, and, um, and, and a desire to know him better, um, because I, it would be lovely to think there was something of a quiet Blake revival in this part of the country particularly that he knew and loved. Um, so I'll talk for about three quarters of an hour, and then there'll, there'll be plenty of time for questions and thoughts and comments um, afterwards, and I very much hope that you'll have some reflections, partly because you know, Blake does want to provoke. Um, he doesn't want to tell you what you already feel comfortable with. He was sure that Christianity was, at the same time, a calling to see much, much more of the world than we're inclined to think we know. But to do that often by challenging, by provoking, by even upsetting. And so I'm going to try and speak as best I can with the full force of what Blake was driving at. And, you know, you must forgive me if that feels offensive or upsetting. Um, the aim is to try and make us think again, because I think he thought that the modern age is one where we're falling asleep, even as we feel we're walking into the future. But we don't know what world we're building, and we're losing touch with greater and greater aspects of reality. And we must make contact with that again. He felt that was the heart of the Christian message, which actually, as I hope to show you, he felt was a universal message. And we clearly need it more so now than even in his time, um, the prophet who saw it coming. So let me give you some sort of background and a sense of his life and times and so on. And um, I looked up um, what Rains Park might have been like when he lived. He was born on the 28th of November, 1757, 1757, so the midpoint of the 18th century, and dies on the 12th of August, 1827, so the beginning of the 19th century. And, and this part of the world would have been deeply rural at the time. In fact, most of the region south of the river would have been rural, around Lambeth, where he and Catherine, his wife and collaborator, lived for perhaps the happiest part of their life, was beginning to be settled a bit. Maybe the odd kind of late Georgian terrace going up in places like Camberwell, where I live. Um, but um, mostly it was still rural, a bit of a breadbasket for London that was situated north of the river, in the west at Westminster, in the east in the city. Um, he also lived on South Moulton Street. Um, it's the only house that um, he and Catherine lived in that's still standing now in Mayfair, but it was called the West End because it literally was the West End of Westminster, again, on the edge of the city. And I stress that because I think it's a good way of understanding Blake. He lived on the edges of the kind of urban spirit and the rural life. And it was being able to traverse those different parts of the world and notice shifts of consciousness even that occur when you move into different spaces. I mean, I don't know how you feel when you walk into a church. It's quite nice walking into a church for the first time because you're not quite sure what's going to be revealed to you inside, what kind of atmosphere, spirit, what presence it's got. And he was very alert, I think, to that um, and felt it 
in London that was so much smaller than now. Within half an hour, pretty much wherever you were in London, you could walk out of the city and be in fields. Um, and that potential that we all have to see the apparently same world in a completely different light is a driving force in his work. So he lives in this time, the end of the 18th, beginning of the 19th century. He's born in Soho. Um, he's the third of 11 children, um, and he doesn't seem to have had particularly close relationships with his siblings, the ones that survived, apart from one, a younger brother called Robert, who tragically died in his early 20s, and Blake describes holding his brother as he died of some kind of consumptive disease. Um, and then um, he knew Robert, though, after Robert died, because one of the things you may know about Blake is that he seemed to live not only in different worlds, as it were, on the mundane earth, but in different worlds, um, spiritual, heavenly, and as well as um, on, on, on this world as we, we normally appreciate it. Um, he famously saw angels in a tree on Peckham Rye, it was remarked by Catherine, his wife, that Blake first saw God at the age of four. Um, I love both the youthfulness of that, but also just the first saw God, um, as if that became a regular occurrence. Um, he lived with the dead um, that he knew, like Robert, um, as well as the great dead, you might say, figures like Ezekiel. Um, he describes in one of his bits of writing seeing Ezekiel one day and asking Ezekiel why he lay on his side for 26 years whatever the story is in the book of Ezekiel. And Ezekiel says it's just to try and make them see that God's around. Um, you have to do extreme things, even in ancient Hebrew times, as much as now. And, um, but then he also um, knew the angels, um, and he says that a lot of his writing was dictated to him by these beings. But I don't think that he regarded himself as an automaton, as if he was just doing automatic writing. Um, he meant that they spoke to him and through him, um, with his collaboration, he became a co-worker um, with these figures. Um, he would say, you know, this was dictated to me even by Jesus, and then I decided how to write it out. Um, he had a vision of what it is to relate to these worlds that's very active and participative. Um, and those two words, active and participation, are ones that he regularly uses to invite us into an engagement with the world that we see as well as the world that we don't immediately see, but he was sure could come to know quite as intimately as the world evidently in front of us. He's baptized in St. James's Piccadilly, another rare bit of the tangible side of his life um, that uh, you can still see. Um, just as a remark, um, first possibly slightly offensive, Mark, if there's any lovers of Georgian churches um, in, the, in the room, but um, Blake loathed the religion, the religiosity of his time. Um, Georgian religion, um, which I still think you can still feel in these Georgian churches, um, was basically aimed at cajoling people. You know, they often had box pews and the, the wealthy would pay for their box pew at the front, the poor would be lucky to get a bench at the back. Um, they're square, they're not like the Gothic buildings that Blake loved. Um, which immediately prompt your eyes to rise, maybe to the top of an arch, maybe up a spire. They're often decorated with naturalistic stone carvings and strange gargoyles and creatures. They're architecture in stone of the worlds that Blake intimately saw and knew, and so he loved the Gothic. He learned to draw in Westminster Abbey, and he loathed the Georgian religiosity of his time. Um, he loathed the art world of his time, too, um, a, a, in a similar way to the religiosity of his time, it tended to aggrandize um, the wealthy. It tended to um, treat people as just masses to be moved around. Um, he wrote um, nasty things even about figures like Joshua Reynolds, the head of the Royal Academy at the time, for those great sort of uh, rich um, oil paintings of the great and the good, um, which you can see in the National Gallery. Uh, and he, he thought they were just... Um, celebrating humanity in all the wrong ways because they collapse us into a kind of flatland of this, world, this worldly richness and glory and so um, constrain our imagination just to see um, what's immediate around us and get confused about what true wealth is, get confused about what true beauty is. Um, and 
So he, he often attacked the religiosity of, of his time as well as the art. Um, luckily for him, his parents saw that he would do well if he left school at the age of 10 and receive a home education. And he learns to read and write and draw and so on, um, largely self-taught um, in that way. But at the age of 14, he's apprenticed to an engraver. And this was probably quite a smart move on his father's part, seeing the young William's artistic potential. But it's an age where people are increasingly buying books, and books need illustrations. And so to become an engraver was actually potentially to have a really quite good living, um, as well as to practice and develop his own artistic ability. And a lot of the, res the work of his that survives are incredibly beautiful illustrations and engravings that he made for the work of others who commissioned him to do so. Um, he becomes a student at the Royal Academy as well. Um, uh, but it's always important, I think, to remember that in this whole mix of Georgian London at the time, there's a lot of turbulence. Um, in the 1780s, for example, he witnesses the Gordon Riots and the burning of Newgate Prison, um, which killed people in the act of the violence and the vandalism and then led to people being um, put to death as well afterwards and um, being hung. Um, a happier moment is when he marries Catherine in 1782. She becomes um, not only his wife, but increasingly his collaborator and outlives him at the end. And his first publications start in the 1780s as well. And he develops, in particular, um, his own way of doing this relief etching. He was very inspired by the medieval illustrators of great books and wanted to have control over the whole process, from the writing to the illustrating to the production of his books. And he said that Robert, his brother who died by this time, appeared to him and showed him a way of doing this relief etching that involved acid burning away the copper of the plates so that the image was standing in relief that he could then print and um, paint and then color as well. And it particularly delighted him because in the action of producing his books, he was enacting what he felt we need to learn to do to perceive the world, which is a bit like the copper dissolving the unnecessary, sorry, the acid dissolving the unnecessary copper is to cleanse the doors of perception, as it was famously put, so that that which really matters is seen in, in definitive relief. And then we'll see the world as it truly is, infinite. Um, if you can practice in your material life what is re being revealed to you in your spiritual life, then you get on this happy, spiritual, virtuous spiral to see more and more and more. Um, he lives in Lambeth, um, south of the river, from 1719 to 1800. And then in 1800, um, he moves for three years out of London, the only time he leaves the city, to Feltham, which is a little village just near Petworth. And um, the owner of Petworth House at the time becomes one of his patrons, invites him to come to the countryside. And at first, this feels to William and Catherine like moving to heaven no less. And let me read a first bit of Blake's verse tonight to capture some of that joy and delight. Um, he writes in a letter to one of his lifelong friends, Thomas Butts, about how delightful it is to move to this lovely cottage near Petworth. And he writes a verse in his letter as well, which goes like this. He says, my first vision of light on the yellow sand sitting, the sun was admitting his glorious beams from heaven's high streams. Over sea, over land, my eyes did expand into regions of air, away from all care, into regions of fire, remote from desire. The light of the morning, heaven's mountains adorning, in particles bright, the jewels of light distinct shone and clear. Amazed and in fear, I each particle gazed, astonished, amazed, for each was a man, human formed. Swift I ran, for they beckoned to me, remote by the sea, saying, each grain of sand, every stone on the land, each rock and each hill, each fountain and rill, each herb and each tree, mountain, hill, earth and sea, cloud, meteor and star, are men seen afar. 
I stood in the beams of heaven's white streams and saw Feltham's sweet beneath my bright feet in soft female charms and in her fair arms. My shadow I knew and my wife's shadow too and my sister and friend. We like infants descend in our shadows on earth like a weak mortal birth. My eyes, more and more like a sea without shore, continue expanding, the heavens commanding to the jewels of light, heavenly men beaming bright, appeared as one man. Now in that ecstatic verse, I hope you can just get a sense of what he thought the human vocation was, which is to see consciously in all things, cloud, meteor, star, um, herb, tree, fountain, rill, rock, hill, to see the divine life, which we can self-consciously know, become aware of directly, but is shared and echoed, beaming radiantly from the world around us. And this is a key part of what he felt the human task was, was to raise and return creation back to the divine source from whence it came, by our perception, by developing this capacity to cleanse away that which isn't necessary and reveal the infinite. And so he does it in his verse, he does it in his illustrations, but more importantly, he does it in his life. And so whatever particular practices we have, that could be our vocation as well. It's, you might say, to participate in the whole of life rather than to try and possess life which of course has become the dominant mode which most people at least live with today. So he's in Feltham, near Petworth House in Sussex, and life seems to be going well, but this shadow he mentions starts to become stronger, and particularly in two ways, because whilst his patron, um, the owner of Petworth House, is in a way very generous to Blake, he doesn't really understand Blake and so commissions Blake to create works that increasingly depress Blake. They take him away from the dancing particles that he sees in the air and become part of the kind of artistic complex of his time, a bit too much like Joshua Reynolds' self-aggrandizing art. Um, and so he starts to fall out of love with the place. And then a particular thing happens is that he accosts a soldier in his garden. It seems that the, gold, the soldier had popped over the hedge, as it were, to relieve himself, and Blake's deeply distressed by this, and manhandles the soldier out. But in the process, the soldier accuses Blake of treason. And this is a deeply serious charge. Um, we're now in the period after the French Revolution into the Napoleonic era, and the Napoleonic Wars are um, spreading across Europe, and England's at war with France in particular. And so to be accused of treason, Blake's accused of cursing the king when he was cursing the soldier, um, is to face potentially a death penalty. Certainly you could be exiled to someone like Australia, you know, on the other side of the known world. Um, and Blake faces these charges and it, I think, deeply disturbed him and um, caused him to fall out of love completely with this part of the world. And I just wanted to read another short verse that he wrote again to Thomas Butts that captures this other side of his life. Because I think it's, it's often easy to slip into the assumption that these great visionaries, these great mystics, live a kind of ecstatic, elated life. Whereas I think the truth is they lived all of life, the shadow as well as the light, the darkness as well as the elevation. And it's because they could say yes to the whole of life without any hesitancy um, that they saw more and more of life as well. Um, another key part of this vocation that we human beings can have, and we can know suffering and embrace what Blake called the furnaces of affliction, as much as seek to be bathed in the fountains of living waters. And so in his depression, towards the end of his time in Feltham, before he returns to London for the last part of his life, he writes to Thomas Butts this, he says, oh why was I born with a different face? Why was, I not why was I not born like the rest of my race? When I look, each one starts. When I speak, I offend. Then I'm silent and passive and lose every friend. 
Then my first I dishonor, my pictures despise, my person degrade and my temper chastise. And the pen is my terror, the pencil my shame, all my talents I bury and dead is my fame. And I'm either too low or too highly prized, when elate I'm envied, when meek I'm despised. He's beginning to get the sense that he's not understood. Few people are going to know of what he's trying to communicate and share. And sure enough, when he gets back to London, he fairly soon afterwards, in the late first decade of the 19th century now, he has his only solo exhibition in a room above a shop. Hardly anyone comes. He gets one review that's damning, says surely this man is mad. And the rumors, for those who even knew who Blake was now, start to suggest that maybe he's just barking crazy. Um, and then towards the end of his life, um, he moves into an apartment on Fountains Court, um, which is just by the Savoy now. Um, there's a nice plaque which you can go and uh, see. Um, and it's said that just from this room, he could see the sparkling of the Thames. Him and Catherine live there. But he does live the last decades or so of his life happy. Um, I think that his breakdown actually led to the final breakthrough. And as well as his great epic verse that he writes in the last part of his life, he also illustrates Dante's Divine Comedy in fantastic images, um, as well as Pilgrim's Progress and other works. Um, and a small group of admirers gather around him. They called themselves the Ancients. They were from a younger generation of people and figures like the artist Martin, pa uh, Martin Palmer, Samuel Palmer, I think it is, who's still known. And um, they just about keep his memory alive, even as he dies in relative obscurity. And then it's only subsequently that his um, work is celebrated and gathers a pace, particularly in the 20th century when figures like Hubert Parry write the words of Jerusalem to that brilliant music, and he becomes known in all sorts of ways as a great creative, as a social critic, um, as um, a, a pol political man of the left, as much as um, someone who might even be thought of as the, from, more from the right, um, a confusing um, but nonetheless intriguing figure. Um, and he's written about now um, quite often, but very often the spiritual side of him is obscured um, it's sort of extracted, and this is in partly what put me on to Blake, um, because I thought that when you read Blake, you know, how can you avoid this multidimensional cosmos that he saw and lived in, um, with God omnipresent, with the figure of Jesus that he knew to be living in him as much as having lived 2,000 years ago? How can you avoid that? Um, and I think it's because we live in the times that have just almost completely lost this imagination. It's not so much that people don't believe, it's just that they don't even know how to conceive of these things anymore. Maybe even churchgoers don't really. And this though, as Blake would tell us if he were here, this darkness is always an opportunity for light as well. He was completely clear that the reason why the darkness can be welcomed into our lives is because it's the place that we see and perceive the light most clearly, most brilliantly, most distinctly. Um, we're not confused and led astray by indefinite pleasures. We can feel the true delight of the divine presence. You know, we're not confused about what life may, might be about, the consumption, the possession of more and more things. No, we know that they don't deliver and so are ready to focus again onto what might lead us to this human vocation, returning ourselves and all things to the divine. And um, I wanted to unpack that now a little bit with um, these images that are on the handout um, and some more of his verse. So um, if you look, first of all, at the image on the front there, sort of instantly recognizable as the image of a crucifix. It comes from one of his later epics called Jerusalem, the Emanation of the Giant Albion. Um, not to be confused with Jerusalem, the hymn, um, but uh, it's a massive thousand page, thousand line, a hundred page poem. Um, and this appears towards the end. And it illustrates 
um, this business about the darkness and the light. Because at first you think there's a crucifix, pretty familiar, um, and you know, how nice and pious is that? Um, but even in this not very good reproduction here, I hope you can see that the tree, the, sorry, the cross on which the Christ figure hang, hangs is actually a tree. And if it were a better reproduction, the speckles that are falling out from the light beams are actually apples. Um, this is a living tree. And this seemingly dead figure is actually shining with light. And then there's the figure who stood beneath the tree. And what you might notice there is that this figure isn't just kind of gazing on in adoration, um, but it's actually participating in the life of the cruciform figure. His hands are outstretched. It might be her. Blake's images are often, um, uh, uh, what's the word, um, androgynous. Um, he, he, he didn't um, draw mostly naturalistically, but instead in a kind of ideal form. He wanted to see the true human figure, not just the one that immediately appears before us. Um, this figure is participating in the life of Christ, learning what it might be to know darkness and light, learning what it might be to become the locus for new life, to pour out into the world. And I think, to my mind, you know, and forgive me if I just get the wrong bit of it all, but this feels to me like a crucial message to churches today that Christianity isn't something that's done to us or something that happened 2,000 years ago. Um, it's not even something that calls us to live a good life. Um, Blake um, was ferocious about the Georgian religiosity of his time, partly because it cajoled people by putting the fear of God in them, making them feel like they must be morally good. And he called this the wastes of the moral law. It, if you feel that Christianity is mostly about how you behave, then it will actually waste your life because you'll be constantly living, living to an ideal and not living yourself. You'll be full of guilt and remorse about your failures to live up to this ideal rather than knowing that it's precisely in the furnaces of affliction, in the mess of life, that this cleansing can take place and the transformation, the perception can occur. And I think that's what we're seeing here in this image of the crucifix, which is also an image of the resurrection. And for those of you who you know, know these things um, a little bit more, I think Blake is deeply inspired by the image of Christ that particularly is portrayed in John's Gospel, where the crucifixion is the moment of glorification for Jesus because it's understood that these things come together in this moment and can come together, therefore, in our own lives as well. Um, the most important incarnation is the one that's happening right here, right now, not the one that happened 2,000 years ago. And becoming attuned to that is of seminal significance, I think, for Blake. It's why he fell out of love with the religiosity of his times. You know, imagine standing up and telling people that their gods, much like Jesus, was the meeting place of human and divinity um, together in the one life. Um, you know, that'd be quite hard to say now. It was certainly hard to say then. And let me read a couple of um, very well-known poems that I hope give a feel of how this can be possible. Um, because it's a big claim to make um, and um, one that is easily misunderstood and must be known, I think, by just feeling a way into what it might mean. And it's in two poems um, from the Songs of Innocence and Experience, one of his relatively early books, um, very well-known anthologized poems, The Lamb and the Tiger. And um, innocence for Blake doesn't mean naivety. Um, it doesn't mean simpleness in the sense of being uh, of simplicity. Um, innocence for Blake meant the stance a bit like the open-armed figure where you make the assumption, even in the darkness, that the world wants to give you, that grace will appear, that the divine is speaking to you. Um, it's childlike in that way, innocence assuming that creation is for you and you're for creation. And experience is the nuance on that. It's the saying yes to all things and knowing that by traveling through the portal of death, life appears even more brilliantly. And you get it in this juxtaposition of these two poems, The Lamb and the Tiger. So let me read them, and then I'll make a few comments that I hope will um, bring out some of the 
the seemingly simple things that he's saying, but this is simple in that other meaning of the word simple as well, where you get into the heart or the essence of something. Um, it's kind of distilled down into um, a brilliant um, few words. So the lamb goes like this. Little lamb, who made thee? Dost thou know who made thee? Gave thee life and bid thee feed by the stream and o'er the mead. Gave thee clothing of delight, softest clothing, woolly, bright. Gave thee such a tender voice, making all the veils rejoice. Little lamb, who made thee? Dost thou know who made thee? Little lamb, I'll tell thee. Little lamb, I'll tell thee. He is called by thy name, for he calls himself a lamb. He is meek and he is mild. He became a little child. I, a child, and thou, a lamb. We are called by his name. Little lamb, God bless thee. Little lamb, God bless thee. So that's from the Songs of Innocence. And then, as is often the case in these, these, this book of poems, it's paired with another one from the Song of Experience, and that's the tiger. And very well known, it goes like this. Tiger, tiger, burning bright in the forests of the night. What immortal hand or eye could frame thy fearful symmetry? In what distant deeps or skies burnt the fire of thine eyes? On what wings dare he aspire? What the hand dare seize the fire? And what shoulder and what art could twist the sinews of thy heart? And when thy heart began to beat, what dread hands and what dread feet? What the hammer, what the chain, in what furnace was thy brain? What the anvil, what dread grasp, dare its deadly terrors clasp? When the stars threw down their spears and watered heaven with their tears, did he smile his work to see? Did he who made the lamb make thee? Tiger, tiger, burning bright in the forests of the night, what immortal hand or eye dare frame thy fearful symmetry? So you've got in the tiger the darkness of life, the hammer, the chain, the furnace, the anvil, the dread grasp, the deadly terror, um, the twisted heart, um, the deeps of darkness from the skies, and the stars throwing down their tears and so on. Um, but did he who made the lamb make thee? So this is the moment of experience where we say yes to life. We don't try and filter. We don't try and separate heaven from hell, as Blake put it. We don't try and falsely live according to what we regard as the good and not become tainted by what we regard as evil. Um, contraries, as Blake famously puts it, are where the dynamism of life is truly found that lives us back to God. Because, you know, if God is all, then God's already said yes to all. And that's why when Blake's reflecting on the lamb and begins in the first verse with those lovely celebrations of the lamb in the dale, um, drinking from the stream, making the mountains rejoice in its delightful image, that's just a portal, a beautiful presence that can lead us into this deeply profound awareness that, first of all, the figure of Jesus, of course, is known as the Lamb. So the Lamb is somehow participating in the life of the Christ. And the Christ also became a child. And I, reading the poem, you, us, we are of that being as well. We're all that I so I, a child, and thou, a lamb, we're called by his name. We participate in this same life. It's a unitive vision of Christianity, a claim not just about how we see the world, but a claim about the way the world actually is. Um, I think you can put Blake in that category of visionaries, mystics, who aren't just in the Christian tradition, but would understand that if you see the world aright, you see that it's all one, it's all part of the divine life. As the Sufis said, everywhere you look is the face of God. As figures from the Indian tradition, the Advaitists would say, there's only one thing, 
and it's God, and our task is to know quite what that can possibly mean. And Blake, I think, is in that tradition. I'm saying this not just sort of fancifully, because we also know that Blake wasn't just influenced by Jewish mysticism, Kabbalah and so on, and Christian mysticism that was returning in his times. Um, he's a, a near contemporary of Charles Wesley, the founder of the Methodists, who at first was a mystic. He knew people like Emanuel Swedenborg, um, a very famous scientist of his times, who then in his 50s had a series of visionary experiences and, like Blake, wrote about heaven and hell as well. Um, but um, books like the Bhagavad Gita, this seminal um, Indian text, um, where the god Krishna reveals himself to be the one god to Arjuna, um, the ancient warrior. And Blake reads the Bhagavad Gita. And in fact, some of his strange names and bits of mythology, which you may have a sense of, I think are inspired as much by these Indian traditions as they are by Christianity. Um, for example, in Jerusalem, the emanation of the giant Albion, the figure of Vala appears at one point, and she seeks to blind people, to throw her veil over people so they can't see the world as it truly is infinite. And I think the name Vala is a mixture of veil and Maya, um, which in Hindu traditions is the ignorance that can't see the world as it truly is. Um, so Vala um, speaks to this way that Blake is modern in another way, um, knowing that he lives in the midst of many traditions and seeking ways that they can be brought together, not by a kind of reduction to a few moral precepts, you know, as if the heart of all religions was the golden rule to do well to others as your hope to be done unto, you know, valuable as that might be. No, 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 he's saying there's something about the way we see things. Can we embrace these seemingly different takes on reality and use that to guide us towards a perception of reality? that can be known in its depths. So, turn also now to um, the poem London, just to get another take on that, to deepen this a little bit more, I hope. Um, it's another very well-known poem by Blake, and I wanted you to see how he produces the poems in this case, because um, this is one where the contrary like the lamb and the tiger, isn't in two different places, but is on the one page. Because if you just looked at the imagery here, you might think this is a rather charming poem about London, because there's an image of an old man on sticks being guided by a young child, and then there's an image of a great warming flame down the side that looks rather homely, as the figure there warms, I think, her hands by it and there's blue, and there's golden coloring, and so on, and there's light even coming down into the street. And yet, the poem itself is a deeply bleak portrayal of the London that he knew, and I'll read the words. It goes, I wander through each chartered street, near where the chartered Thames does flow, and mark in every face I meet marks of weakness, marks of woe, in every cry of every man, in every infant's cry of fear, in every voice, in every ban, the mind forged manacles I hear. How the chimney sweepers cry, every blackening church appalls, and the hapless soldier's sigh runs in blood down palace walls. But most through midnight streets I hear how the youthful harlot's curse blasts the newborn infant's tear and blights with plagues the marriage hearse. This is an image of a city that has lost its way. The chimney sweepers are blackening the churches, and I think that means not just if they found their way into the church, leaving their black footprints on the grounds, but are darkening the, what Christianity stands for, because, of course, they use the chimney sweepers too. Um, it's the Napoleonic Wars. The hapless soldier's sigh runs in blood down palace walls. Um, it's a street filled with pleasure seekers, a city that's actually finding itself running on cheap thrills, teenage kicks, you might say, um, and so, 
good business for harlots, but bringing the plagues into not the marriage bed, but as Blake calls it, the marriage hearse. It's a deeply distressed city where the chartered streets have become not thoroughfares that we might walk to know the delights of the place, but possessed by individuals where you might get into trouble for walking down the streets um, rather than engaging in the life of the city. And so it leaves all the faces with marks of weakness, marks of woe, and he just sees cries in every face. But, as always with Blake, in the darkness are clues to where the light can be found. And partly that's in one of his best-known expressions that's in this poem, the mind forge manacles. And this is Blake at his sort of philosophically most penetrating, because if it's true that the manacles that trap us, that bind us, that wear us down, are only secondarily material, you know, perhaps literally on occasion made of iron, um, but otherwise are the other objects in life that actually tie us to a narrow life in the service of them. You know, maybe that's by um, mortgages, by insurance policies, by all these things that we um, organize our lives around to try and secure our possessions. Um, Ultimately, this is the product of our minds, these manacles. This is where their true source springs from, because we've imagined that life must be lived in this way, and we've lost the imagination to see how it might be lived in any other way. And Blake is very um, penetrating on the imagination. He realizes that everything we see, we see not directly, but through the imagination that we have. You know, we imagine that um, we are solid objects standing on solid ground um, in a solid building um, that we receive most directly through the empirical senses of our sight and hearing the echo perhaps and feeling the firmness beneath our feet, um, feeling the warmth in the air, of course, this evening. Um, but science now will tell you that's only one way of interpreting the way the world actually is. And it's a material imagination that means that we experience the world in this way, when actually you know, the solid floor and walls and the solidity of our bodies is mostly empty space. And for Blake, if he knew that account of modern physics, I think that would have been a delight to him, because he would have seen how that's a cue for the imagination to see the world in other ways as well, um, to see that architecture in stone, for example, is trying to lift our eyes to beautiful perceptions um, that it echoes and captures in the ways that it can. Um, that maybe the solidity of our bodies and the solidity of our feet um, is actually speaking about a world that's much surer, much more certain, which we can know as well, but in our spirits, in our souls, rather than just through our eyes and ears. Um, he writes about this in a famous remark about what he sees when he sees the sunrise. And it's in a dialogue um, in a notebook that he left, which is now published as A Vision of the Last Judgment. And in this little section, which I'll read out, he imagines someone seeing the sun rising in the east um, as like a golden disc, which he likens to a guinea, you know, the coin that's made of gold and so sort of shines and sparkles. And Blake says, no, 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 I don't see that. I see something entirely different. And he gives us clues as to how we can see what he sees as well. So he, he writes like this in this notebook. He says, I, speaking in his own voice, assert for myself that I do not behold the outward creation. So what he's saying there is that he doesn't just stay at the empirical world that we're told is the most substantial, the most real aspect of things around us. Um, he doesn't stay at the outward creation. Um, and that, to me, it's a hindrance and not action. So he's saying that if you do stay there, then your life will stay in this mind-forged, manical way. And moreover, it leaves you passive in relation to the world, um, being told how to receive it, um, not engaging your imagination in fresh possibilities, um, which he says is a mode of action 
working with all you are, bringing all of that to all that is around you and seeing what emerges in this collaboration, this co-working with the emergence of reality. And then his interlocutor says to him, what? When the sun rises, do you not see a round disk of fire, somewhat like a guinea? You know, the, the, the immediate thing that we might see um, when we try and glimpse the sun in the sky. And Blake replies and says, oh no, no. I see an innumerable company of the heavenly host crying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Blake lives in this long tradition um, that in the West is often associated, going all the way back to Plato and no doubt before, that realizes that the light which we see with our empirical eyes is just an echo or reflection of the true light which is known with the mind's eye and we feel in our souls. It's why when we're not sweltering, the warmth of the day, the light of the skies actually enlivens us. Um, it makes us feel that we're connected to things. Um, that's because we intuitively, immediately and directly experience the true light of which the physical light is just a kind of reminder or an echo. And so Blake says, when I see the sun, I see the holy, holy, holy being cried. Um, and then he adds another thought. He says, I question not my corporeal eye any more than I would question a window concerning a sight. So what he's saying is that when he sees the sun, he doesn't say to his physical eye, his corporeal eye, oh, I, what have you got in you? Any more than if you look out of a window, you'd say to the window, window, what's in your glass? That would be a ridiculous thing to say. You look through the glass much as you look through the outward appearance to perceive the world as it truly is cleansing the doors of perception and so seeing things infinite. And so he says, I look through it and not with it. That's a clue to how we can begin to develop the capacities that Blake knew and analyzed um, in an attempt to communicate things to us. Now, just check the time. It's half past eight already. So I've been going for about an hour, actually, haven't I? So, no, we started about quarter to eight, didn't we? So. Just another five minutes. Let me give you another bit um, of, of Blake um, in conclusion that maybe just gives us an, inflects it in another way. If you look at another page, I think it's the inside page, um, where you can just see Jerusalem and then a lot of writing and an image there. And this is from Blake's last work, Jerusalem, the Emanation of the Giant Albion, um, uh, this tremendous poem. And it describes Albion falling asleep and refusing the advances of Jerusalem, who is the embodiment of the divine spirit, his emanation. And Albion is, if you like, the kind of archangel or power of this land. Um, it's what we feel when we just for a moment ask ourselves, you know, what's it like to live in this place? What's it like to be in England, maybe even be English? Um, Blake would say what we're doing when we do that is making contact, participating in the life of the place, which he calls Albion, a kind of giant, great angel um, that lives in and amongst us as we live in and amongst this country. And of course, other countries have different spirits and um, all that we experience, Blake argue, can be known as entities, beings, um, that we're engaged with as well. It's part of what he means when he says, don't look with the eye, but look through the eye, look through the senses um, to this wider reality. So Jerusalem, the emanation of the giant Albion, um, is a, this long exploration of what happens when Albion refuses this reality. And it's a sharp critique of the modern world, which still carries on to this day. So I'm gonna read it through this first page, partly because it's, if you want to get into Blake a bit more, it's quite good to read it out, and then you start to feel what he's driving at, and then you can sort of return to it and try and understand um, in more detail, because he's always a sharp thinker as well as painting these great images too. And so it goes like this at the beginning. He writes, of the sleep of Ulro and of the passage through eternal death and of the awakening to eternal life, this theme calls me in sleep night after night, and every morn awakes me at sunrise, 
Then I see the Savior over me, spreading his beams of love and dictating the words of this mild song. Awake, awake, O sleeper of the land of shadows. Wake, expand. I am in you and you in me, mutual in love divine. Fibers of love from man to man through Albion's pleasant land. In all the dark Atlantic vale from the hills of Surrey, a black water accumulates. Return, Albion, return. Thy brethren call thee and thy fathers and thy sons, thy nurses and thy mothers, thy sisters and thy daughters. Weep at thy soul's disease, and the divine vision is darkened. Thy emanation that was wont to play before thy face, beaming forth with her daughters into the divine bosom, where hast thou hidden thy emanation, lovely Jerusalem, from the vision and fruition of the Holy One? I'm not a God afar off, I'm a brother and friend. Within your bosoms I reside, and you reside in me. Lo, we are one, forgiving all evil, not seeking recompense. Ye are my members, O ye sleepers of Beulah, land of shades. But the perturbed man away turns down the valleys dark. And this is what Albion says. Phantom of the overheated brain, shadow of immortality, seeking to keep my soul a victim to thy love, which binds man, the enemy of man, into deceitful friendships. Jerusalem is not... Her daughters are indefinite. By demonstration, man alone can live, and not by faith. My mountains are my own, and I will keep them to myself. The Malvern and the Cheviot, the walls Phil Hillian and Snowden are mine. Here will I build my laws of moral virtue. Humanity shall be no more, but war and princedom and victory. So spoke Albion in jealous fears hiding his emanation upon the Thames and Medway, rivers of Beulah, dissembling his jealousy before the throne divine, darkening cold. So I hope you can see, you know, what the promise is and what Albion turns from. But it's willful in one way, but it's a trap in another. Um, You know, by demonstration, man alone can live. Um, This is the follow the science call when it becomes uncoupled from that which it's trying to illuminate, uh, treating its laws and abstractions and generalizations as the truth rather than as illuminations of what Blake called the minute particulars that enable us to see the world more clearly. My mountains are my own and I will keep them to myself. The world that has become chartered like the streets, like the Thames, so that everything is possessed and everything therefore is defended rather than inviting us to participate freely in its life. This is a world that traps us, that even if we want to resist it, it's very hard to know how. And that's partly what Blake unpacks for us in this great poem. It's so long because he wants us to feel every fiber, every nook of the darkness. And by understanding that as full as we possibly can, that begins to make the space around which we can see the light and so find ways of being, to use Paul's expression, in the world but not of the world. A key task, I think, for Christianity and all human beings really today. And let me just finish by these four little plates on the back page that crystallize um, Blake's message. And then I hope there might be a few thoughts or comments as well. Because he is this deeply sharp and penetrating analyst of our times. He's a philosopher as well as a visionary. Um, And and that's what I hope to try and communicate. It's what I'm struggling with myself to really understand, actually. Um, He writes in the early part of his life, one of his first books is a very short, tiny, tiny book. Um, They have it at Tate Britain, one copy of it, um, called There Is No Natural Religion. And it's a series of about a dozen aphorisms Um, And it summarizes, you might say, Blake's creed, um, which isn't so much a creed as in something that he feels he ought to confess, but is a summary analysis that's going to guide him through all the great productions of his life. 
And it's called There's No Natural Religion because he lived in a time where people were already explaining a religion by explaining it away, saying it's just the byproduct of the human need to survive, the human need to cultivate goodwill amongst people. Um, he lived before Charles Darwin, of course, but no doubt he would have applied this to the Darwinian ideas that religion was good for human sociality on the savannah 150,000 years ago, um, you know, and fine if you want to believe in gods or whatever, but the real purpose is purely natural ends. He's saying, no, there's no natural religion. And the reason is not just because he's a refused Nick, um, but because of an analysis. And in the, um, the plate to the right there, I don't know if you can quite read it, but I, I'll read it out. Um, he writes this, he says, the bounded is loathed by its possessor. The same dull round, even of a universe, will become a mill with complicated wheels. Now what he's saying is that if life is contained within what we, what we now call the natural sciences, if, as it were, there could be a theory of everything that would tie all things up, even the, the hope, the yearning, um, the desire for that, Blake says is already inviting us to inhabit a bounded universe, one that's limited, that's constrained by material descriptions of it. And he spots immediately that the bounded world is loathed by its possessor. And isn't that such a sharp description of our times with the best will in the world, the spirit that's taken over us loathes this material world that we've described the universe by. It treats it abusively, would consume it, and even with a spirit that refuses that, wants to resist it, it's as if there's a great angel that is keeping this loathing going, and we don't know how to escape from it. And Blake says that part of the trouble is that we have treat the cosmos as if it's bound, as if it has got um, uh, sort of an edge um, beyond which we can't see. It's contained by materialism. Um, the same dull round of, a u of a each, even of a universe, he says, would become a mill with complicated wheels. And I felt that just today. I don't know if you saw the James Webb telescope images that were released today. And in a way, these astonishing images um, stretching back, you know, 13 billion years or more, incredibly beautiful. And yet, at the same time, these images will be analyzed as if they're just data points um, by material science, um, trying to describe the world in physical laws. And you know, in, in modern science, you, you feel this almost unbearable tension sometimes, um, that whilst in on the one hand, someone like Brian Cox will appear on your telly and directly or indirectly tell you that you know, it's a vast, empty void that's unfathomably empty, um, with absolutely zero meaning and purpose. But the odd thing is that he stood on a mountaintop where he's been flown at vast expense, no doubt, um, with an orchestra playing music in the background, inspiring us to treat these things as beautiful too. This is the world we live in that's so trapped that it doesn't know what to make of the things that immediately speak of beauty that we treat as bounded, and then the next moment we treat it as just a series of complicated wheels, um, as Blake puts it, even when it is the whole universe we're talking about. And this is just, is, just isn't a, a sort of aesthetic point for Blake. Um, it deeply matters to the way in which we live, and that's captured in the little box um, on the bottom left there, which you may just be able to read. Um, but let me read it out again. This is what Blake says. He says, if the many became the same as the few when possessed. More, more is the cry of a mistaken soul. Less than all cannot satisfy man. And this compressed aphoristic style makes you kind of wrestle with it. What on earth is he saying? This is what I think he's saying. He's saying, if the many, and by the many, he means the myriad things that fill our world, that we know in each other, that we see in these tremendous images from the cosmos as well. The many, the myriad things, what Blake calls the minute particulars, 
Um, and these really matter to Blake because he thinks that we see the divine in the minute particulars. You know, we see heaven in a wild flower. We hold eternity in the palm of our hand. Um, it's by attending to the particular, to the imminent, that we find ourselves released into the transcendent and the infinite. This is another message of the incarnation, of course. So if the many, he says, become the same as the few when possessed. Now this is the lie of the modern world, that it tells us that we can share in the richness of life by possessing a few trinkets that would claim to represent the many. Um, and so another facet of the way that we organize our lives now is to earn the cash that can buy a few things that we can then call our own and call our lives. And Blake says that that possessive spirit, that consumptive spirit, is denying you the all. And so more more, he continues, is the cry of a mistaken soul. You know, more more is the, the cry of the consumptive age. If only I could have a few more things that I'd have a bit more happiness. He's saying, no, 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 less than all can't satisfy us. And so we must learn how to embrace all that is. Um, you know, this is quite a political comment now because um, in a ecologically minded time, fear of climate change and so on, um, the cry is increasing that we must curtail our desires, we must develop zero growth economies. And in a way, there's truth in that. But Blake would said, beware, because what you might be fighting against there is the human spirit that rightly longs for the all. Because the divine is within us, that's the nature of our souls. It's become confused in a capitalist age as if that can be satisfied by material possession. That's absolutely right. But we must understand that the spirit in us won't be satisfied with a new economy, with um, a new way of trying to organize things materially. What we need to do is educate ourselves to, as he summarizes it, kiss the joy as it flies. And this is another quatrain where he summarizes um, the way that we should live. You could spend your whole life contemplating this and trying to gradually become more and more aligned with it. But he says this, he says, he who binds to himself the joy does the winged life destroy. He who kisses the joy as it flies lives in eternity's sunrise. So he, the person, he uses the generic he who binds to himself the joy. So if you try and say, I've got to do this to be happy, you need to do that to secure, um, you know, protect against depression, bind yourself to these things, try and sort of manage your life, cling to things. Does the winged life destroy? You're actually cutting yourself off from life by doing that. Whereas he who kisses the joy as it flies, that lovely image of participation, lives in eternity's sunrise. And of course, eternity's sunrise just keeps coming. It's infinite. There's no end to it. And that's where satisfaction can be found. And so he summarizes my final thought, all that in what he sees as the Christian image. It goes all the way back. The patristic fathers said this. Um, Jesus says it in John's gospel. Um, Therefore, God becomes as we are, that we may be as he is. I think that's the heart of his message put in an explicitly theistic religious frame, the significance of the figure of Jesus for him. But I hope you can feel how it spreads out in all ways. It isn't just a spiritual vision, but is deeply pressing, but seriously challenging for our times as well. I'll end there and hope there's thoughts and comments uh, to you know, amplify things. I've heard this, sometimes the simplest Seeming questions are simple in that double sense because they're trying to get to the heart of something, which is what really matters. So please, over to you. Or we will move swiftly to the material things that are sometimes good, called refreshments. If someone did want to kick us off with the first question, that would be great. Thank you so much. Thank you. If you shout out, then I could repeat it. Yeah.
Yeah, look, it's a key question. I'm a psychotherapist. I worked for five years in the Maudsley Hospital. Um, I um, know what psychosis um, can mean, and it's not a happy place for the most part. Um, but what you notice with people who are psychotic um, is that they're caught up in the same dull round um, that Blake describes the material world um, as well. Um, Blake's near contemporary Samuel Taylor Coleridge uh, makes a very pressing, press, uh, penetrating remark about the difference between fantasies, which um, you know, psychosis can leave you trapped in, um, as opposed to the imagination proper. And what Coleridge says is that you can tell the difference because the imagination proper is sharing in divine creativity and so takes you more and more into life in undefended ways, in open ways, in ways that spread the joy and delight to those around you. Don't make others want to back off in fear for, you know, in case the insanity spreads. Um, and I think that's a key test, a key way of discerning these things. Um, uh, it's not always easy and sometimes can be quite confusing because sometimes you know, psychotic people become a bit porous and when you're working with them, you wonder, you know, are they seeing things that my rather well-controlled ego has sort of debarred from me? Um, but nonetheless, at the end of the day, what matters is the creativity it spawns. And Coleridge with Blake would say that's because the imagination proper is sharing in the divine creativity um, in an echo and reflection. Yeah, I'll, I'll repeat the question as well just for now. So um, the, the question was about Catherine, his wife, and whether, um, I'm, I'm, I'm half mentioned that she became a collaborator and whether she shared his visions. Um, she certainly became his collaborator towards the end. So now the art historians think that she helped color his plates, for example, um, because they can detect a slightly different hand in different versions of his, tech, of his works. Um, and... Um, she, you know, they lived mostly in humble um, accommodation, maybe just a couple of rooms. I don't think they ever fell into abject poverty, but um, they did sometimes struggle to know quite how to make ends meet. And there are stories of Catherine sort of putting an empty dinner plate in front of William and saying, look, you've got to eat William too. Um, you know, when are you going to sell something? Um, so um, you can think of her in that way. Um, the other um, story that um, is told often about Catherine and William is that um, William at one point made Catherine Clark cry and there's actually a, a, a biography of them two of the two together called Mrs. Blake cried when Mrs. Blake cried and the story there is that um, amongst the Swedenborgians and other of these dissenting uh, mystical sects that were springing up all over the place in Georgian London um, were those that were very interested in the erotic and um, it's possible that Blake's mother belonged to um, a Christian group that were very fascinated by the erotic and how it could lead to visions of, and experiences of the divine. And um, the reason why Mrs. Blake cried, perhaps, is that Blake thought that he might pursue this erotic way um, by taking a lover um, and seeing you know, what fresh delights he could discover with this lover um, and where he transported him. Um, and he asked Catherine about this, and she didn't want it to happen. And I'm almost certain that that was enough for Blake, um, because he would have known that the erotic doesn't lead you to the divine when you just seek another sexual experience, but rather, as is known all the way back to the time of Plato, and is in the Divine Comedy big time, um, this, the first kind of sexual experience is the awakening moment that then we must learn to track into wider and wider experiences of beauty and passion, um, not just a succession of, you know, uh, of, of thrills. Um, and so not a huge amount is known about Catherine, but that perhaps gives you some sense of it. They met um, and Blake had just fallen out of a previous relationship um, and was deeply distraught by it. And when they met, um, Catherine asked him about it. And immediately, Blake was deeply touched by her concern for him. 
and it said fell in love with her there and then. Um, another lovely story is that on his deathbed, um, Catherine was there helping nurse him, and um, he said um, as she approached the bed, Catherine, sit still, and drew um, a beautiful line drawing of her, even at the last, and said, You'd, you've always been an angel to me. Um, so I think they had a, a, rump, a bumpy, um, maybe a rumpy, pumpy a relationship at times too. Um, but um, uh, they, she certainly understood and championed him. Um, and I, I imagine you can't live with someone like that for too long without starting to have your imagination fired and inspired as well. Yeah. Another thought right at the front. We've got the mic, maybe we can... What, what do you think Blake would make of Jerusalem the Hymn? Because it seems to me it's come quite a nationalistic... You know, it's probably the best-known um, work of his that's sung most often. But it seems that we've kind of made it bombastic and nationalistic and so forth, and what would he make of that? Yeah. I think, as ever, he would see two sides to it. He would see light and darkness. He would see nationalism in its pejorative sense, but also a desire to love your country too. Um, you know, it, it's a, it's, the words have an interesting history. They're, they're in the preface to another one of his epic poems called Milton. Um, and Blake, it seems, didn't hold them especially dearly, in fact, because the preface um, is sometimes included in productions of Milton, and sometimes he doesn't bother printing it. It may be just he ran out of paper, um, but nonetheless, um, the words which he's perhaps best known for now, it's slightly unclear what he made of them. Um, they certainly hark back to deep English mythology and the idea that Jesus visited um, these lands, landing somewhere in the West Country with Joseph of Arimathea. Um, but I think he would, um, at the end of the day, I think he would be glad that they're sung, um, and he would put up with the darkness if that's the way it's perceived, um, because at least the flame of wanting to love your place, which is as much part of the divine presence as anything else, is somehow alive in them. And even if people sing them without quite knowing what the mental fight might be and so on, um, you know, words have a power of their own. They too have angels and presences. And so all is not lost whilst they're being sung, you might say. Yeah. I know some clergymen refuse to have the hymns sung in their church. Um, they've become so loathed of it, but that seems to me to be a bit of a shame. Yeah, his, he, um, the, the, the words have been used in different contexts. Um, certainly um, in an earlier incarnation, they were used as the, um, you know, the, the hymn, I get these confused, so forgive me, but it was either the, I think it was the Women's Institute um, in the Victorian period. Yeah, so that, that puts them in a different setting and gives them a different meaning. Um, and, um, you know, Blake himself has a long association with that side of modern life as well. Um, for example, he illustrated books by Mary Wollstonecraft, who wrote children's books before she wrote The Vindication of the Rights of Woman. So um, these words, another side can be found, put it like that. Thank you. Maybe this will be the last as we're approaching nine o'clock now. Thank you, Mark, for a fantastic talk. <clears throat> I absolutely love that Blake poem, uh, My Guardian Angel. And in a lot of work uh, I do in ministry, when you meet people who sort of aren't regular churchgoers, they will often talk about a perception they have of angels, in particular guardian angels, much more often than they would about believing in God, uh, let alone knowing uh, Jesus or anything uh, we would talk about in church. Why, why do you think, well, why do you think either angels capture people's imagination or angels are more readily perceived than um, divinity itself? Yeah, I mean, you, you, your sense of this is probably as good as mine. Um, I mean, I think Jesus has become a persecuting figure to most people. Um, I used to be a clergyman in the Church of England, and um, if I'm with an audience um, that I want to um, ingratiate myself with, um, it's a very good opening gambit to say, I used to be a, ch a priest in the Church of England, because um, they somehow feel that you're on their side, um, and, um, which may or may not be the case. But um, I think that is 
um, either people um, feel almost nothing about the figure of Jesus, um, or they feel guilty, um, or um, they feel he's a sort of moral teacher that um, they can't possibly live up to. Um, they've probably got a divorce in their family. Jesus was against that. They certainly had sex before they got married. Jesus was against that. Um, you know, sometimes a bishop pops up and says that the government's immigration scheme is bad, and they think, oh, well, maybe Jesus isn't quite so bad, but then they, that's putting religion too much in the kind of moral camp and the waste of the moral law are the next thing they think of, and so they think, well, it's probably not for me. Um, but, um, you know, angelic presences and the sense that even in the darkest times, there's some, someone maybe even that's on your side, because, you know, it's often in the darkest times that you feel that, even with the risk that you don't feel that, um, is um, spoken of in people's lives through entities like guardian angels, um, which, of course, is part of Christian teaching as well. Um, I'm looking at the figure of Michael at the back there just now, um, and um, an archangel, so one that um, in the Hebrew Bible say it's the, the, the angel of Israel, um, and uh, much like Albion is the, the angel of England in Blake's mythology. Um, but, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm rather glad that these things are talked about. Um, I, I see signs of hope in them. We'll draw to a close, um, and um, uh, do pick up a bit of Blake. Um, you know, read a song of innocence and experience, and then read it again and read it again, and just feel how it starts to inspire you and take you somewhere. Um, and remember that he perhaps even walked um, in fields nearby here and breathed the same air, knew the same times, um, and be part of trying to rally what we need of him again in our times. Thanks very much.